tell me of a man most profound. Muse tell me how he wandered and was lost when he had sacked the holy city of Troy. And where he went, and who he met, the pain he suffered on the sea, and how he endeavored to save his life and bring his own men back home. He failed, and for their own follies they perished. They devoured the sun god's cattle, and the god kept them from home. Now, goddess, child of Zeus, tell the old story for our modern times. Find the beginning. All the other Greeks who had survived the brutal sack of Troy sailed safely home to their own wives, save this man alone. Calypso, a great goddess, had trapped him in her cave and wanted him to be her husband. When the year rolled round in which the gods decreed he should go home to Ithaca, his troubles still lingered. The man was friendless. All the gods took pity, but Poseidon's anger never ended until Odysseus was home. But now the distant Ethiopians, who live between the sunset and the dawn, were worshipping the sea god with a feast, a hundred cattle and a hundred rams. There sat the god, delighting in his banquet. The other gods were gathered on Olympus, in Father Zeus's palace. Athena gazed at Zeus and said, Father, I am agonizing over Odysseus and his misfortune. For too long he has suffered with no friends, sea all around him, sea on every side, out on an island where a goddess lives. Who holds that poor unhappy man and tries beguiling him with gentle words to cease all thoughts of Ithaca. But he longs to see even just the smoke that rises from his own homeland, and he wants to die. You do not care, Olympian? Remember how he used to sacrifice to you on the broad plains of Troy beside his ships? So why do you dismiss Odysseus? Daughter, Cloud God said, you must be jesting, since how could I forget Odysseus? He is more sensible than other humans, and makes more sacrifices to the gods. But Lord Poseidon rages, unrelenting, for Odysseus destroyed the eye of godlike Polyphemus, his own son, the strongest of the Cyclops. The Lord of Earthquakes prevents Odysseus from reaching home, but does not kill him. Come then, we must plan. How can he get back home? Poseidon must give up his anger, since he alone cannot fight against the will of all the gods. Athena's eyes lit up, and she replied, Great father, if the blessed gods at last will let Odysseus return home, 
then hurry. We must send our messenger, Hermes the Giant Slayer. He must swoop down to Ogaija right away and tell the beautiful Calypso we have formed a resolution that Odysseus has waited long enough. He must go home, and I will go to Ithaca to rouse the courage of his son, and to make him call a meeting, to speak out against the other suitors who kill his flocks of sheep and cattle incessantly. Then I will send him off to Pylos, and then to Sparta, to seek news of his father's journey home, and to gain a noble reputation for himself. With that she tied her sandals to her feet, the marvelous golden sandals that she wears to travel sea and land as fast as wind. Then from the mountain down she sped to Ithaca, and stopped outside Odysseus's court, bronze spear in hand. She looked like Mentes now, the Tafian leader, a guest friend of their family. There she found the lordly suitors sitting on hides. Telemachus was sitting with them, feeling dejected. In his mind he saw visions of his father coming from abroad, scattering the suitors and gaining back his honor and control of all his land. With this in mind, he was the first to see Athena there. He disapproved of leaving strangers stranded, so he went straight to meet her at the gate and shook her hand and took her spear of bronze and let his words fly out to her. Good evening, stranger, and welcome. Be our guest, come share our repasts, and tell us what you need. He led her in, and Pallas followed him. Inside the high-roofed hall he set her spear beside a pillar in a polished stand, in which Odysseus kept stores of weapons. Then he led her to a chair. He sat beside her in his own chair of inlaid wood, a distance from the suitors, so their shouting would not upset the stranger during dinner, and also to ask of his absent father. A girl brought a washing water in a jug of gold, and poured it on their hands and into a silver bowl and set a table by them. A deferential slave brought bread and laid a wide array of food, a generous spread. The carver set beside them plates of meat of every kind, and gave them golden cups. The cupboy kept on topping up the wine as the suitors sauntered in and sat on chairs, observing proper order. Then the slaves poured water on their hands, and the house girls brought baskets of bread and heaped it up beside them.
Houseboys filled their wine boots up with drink, and then they all reached to take the good things set before them. Once they were satisfied with food and drink, they set their mind to other things, singing, dancing, glories of the feast. A slave brought out a well-tuned lyre and gave it to Femius, the man the suitors forced to sing for them. And then he struck the chords to begin his lovely song. Telemachus leaned in close to Athena so they would not hear, and said, Dear guests, excuse my saying this. These men are only interested in music and life of ease. They make no contribution. This food belongs to someone else, a man whose white bones may be lying in the rain or sunk beneath the waves. If they saw him return to Atheca, they would all pray for faster feet instead of wealth and gold and lavish clothes. In fact, he must have died. We have no hope. He will not come back home. And if someone says otherwise, I do not believe them. But come now, tell me this and tell the truth. Who are you? From what city and what parents? What kind of ship did you arrive here on? What sailors brought you here and by what route? You surely did not travel here on foot. Here's the thing I truly want to know. Have you been here before? Are you a friend who visited my father? Many men came to his house. He traveled many places. Athena's clear, bright eyes met his. She said, Yes, I will tell you everything. I am Mentes, the son of wise Anchiolus, lord of the Taphians, who love the ore. I traveled with my ship and my companions over the wine-dark sea to foreign lands with iron that I hope to trade for copper in Timaeus. My ship is in the harbor far from the town beneath the woody hill. And you and I are guest friends through our fathers from long ago. Laertes can attest it. I hear that fine old man no longer comes to town, but lives out in the countryside stricken by grief, with only one old slave who gives him food and drink when he trails back, leg-weary from his orchard rich in vines. I came because they told me that your father was here. 
but now it seems the gods have blocked his path home. But I am sure that he is not yet dead. The wide sea keeps him trapped upon some island, captured by fierce men who will not let him go. Now I will make a prophecy the gods have given me, and I think it will all come true, although I am no prophet. He will not be gone much longer from his own dear native land, even if chains of iron hold him fast. He will devise a means of getting home. He is resourceful. Tell me now, are you Odysseus's son? You are so tall. Your handsome face and eyes resemble his. We often met and knew each other well, before he went to Troy, where all the best leaders of Argos sailed in hollow ships. From that time on we have not seen each other. Telemachus was careful, as he answered. Dear guest, I will be frank with you. My mother says that I am his son, but I cannot be sure, since no one knows his own begetting. I wish I were the son of someone lucky, who could grow old at home with all his wealth. Instead, the most unlucky man alive is said to be my father. Since you ask. Athena looked at him with sparkling eyes. Son of Penelope, you and your sons will make a name in history, since you were so clever. But now tell me this. Who are these banqueters, and what is the occasion? A drinking party, or a wedding feast? They look so arrogant and self-indulgent, making themselves all at home. A wise observer would surely disapprove of how they act. Telemachus said moodily, my friend, since you have raised the subject, there was once a time when this house here was doing well, our future bright, when he was still at home. But now the gods have changed their plans and cursed us, and cast my father into utter darkness. If he had died, it would not be this grim. If he had fallen with his friends at Troy, or in his loved one's arms when he had wound the threads of war to end. The Greeks would then have built a tomb for him. He would have won fame for his son. But now the winds have seized him, and he is nameless and unknown. He left nothing but tears for me. I do not weep only for him. The gods have given me so many other troubles. All the chiefs of Same, Zacynthus, Delicium, and local lords from rocky Ithaca are courting mother, wasting our whole house. She does not turn these awful suitors down, nor can she end the courting.
They keep eating and spoiling my house, and soon they will kill me. Athena said in outrage, This is monstrous. You need Odysseus to come back home and lay his hands on all those shameless suitors. If only he would come down here now and stand right at the gates, with two spears in his hands and shield and helmet as when I first saw him. May Odysseus come meet the suitors with that urge to kill, a bitter courtship and short life for them. But whether he comes home to take revenge or not is with the gods. You must consider how best to drive these suitors from your house. Come, listen carefully to what I say. Tomorrow call the Achaean chiefs to meeting and tell the suitors, let the gods be witness. All of you go away, to your own homes. As for your mother... If she wants to marry, let her return to her great father's home. They will make her a wedding and prepare abundant gifts to show her father's love. Now here is some advice from me for you. Fit out a ship with twenty oars, the best, and go out and find your long-lost father, or news of him. Someone may tell you news, or you may hear a voice from Zeus, the best source of information. First go to Pylos, question godlike Nestor. From there to Sparta, visit Menelaus. He came home last of all the Achaean heroes. If you should hear that he is still alive and coming home, Put up with this abuse for one more year. But if you hear that he is dead, go home, and build a tomb for him, and hold a lavish funeral to show the honor he deserves, and give your mother in marriage to a man. When this is done, consider deeply how you might be able to kill the suitors in your halls. By tricks or openly. You must not stick to childhood. You are no longer just a little boy. Dear boy, I see how big and tall you are. Be brave and win yourself a lasting name. But I must go now on my nimble ship. My friends are getting tired of waiting for me. Remember what I said and heed my words. Telemachus was brooding on her words, and said, Dear guest, you are so kind to give me this fatherly advice. I will remember. I know that you are eager to be off, but please enjoy a bath before you go, and take a gift with you.
I want to give you a precious, pretty treasure as a keepsake to mark our special friendship. But the goddess Athena met his gaze and said, Do not hold me back now. I must be on my way. As for the gift you feel inspired to give me, save it for when I come on my way home, and let me give you gifts then as well in fair exchange. With that, the owl-eyed goddess flew away like a bird, up through the smoke. She left him feeling braver, more determined, and with his father even more in mind. Watching her go, he was amazed, and saw she was a god. Then, godlike, he went off to meet the suitors. They were sitting calmly, listening to the poet, who sang how Athena cursed the journey of the Greeks as they were sailing home from Troy. The suitors danced and enjoyed themselves till evening. Then they went back to home to sleep. Telemachus's bedroom had been built above this courtyard, so it had a view. He went upstairs, preoccupied by thought. He slept the night there, wrapped in woolen blankets, planning the journey told to him by Athena. Book Two The early dawn was born, her fingers bloomed. Odysseus's well-loved son jumped up, donned his clothes, and strapped his sword across his back, and tied his handsome sandals onto his well-oiled feet. He left the room looking just like a god. He quickly told the clear-voiced heralds that they must call the Greeks to council. Soon the men, their long dark hair flowing, were gathered all together in the square. Telemachus then arrived. Athena poured a heavenly grace upon him. The elders let him join them, and he sat upon his father's throne. The first to speak was wise Aegyptius, a bent old soldier. He spoke in tears. People of Atheca, now hear my words. We have not met in council since the day Odysseus departed with his ships. Who called us? Someone old or young? And why? Has he learned an army is approaching? Or does he have some other piece of news with which he would like to share with all of us? I think he is a helpful, decent man. I hope that Zeus rewards his good intentions. Odysseus's loving son felt glad, and eagerly got up to speak, and stood among them in the center of the group. The competent official, named Pisonor, 
passed him the speaking stick. He held it up and first addressed Egyptius. Here, sir, now look no further for the man you seek. I called this meeting. I am in deep trouble. I have no information of an army that might attack us, nor do I have news of any other danger to our people. I need this help for myself. My family has suffered two disasters. First, I lost my father, who was kind to you as if you were also his sons. Now, even worse, my house is being torn apart. My wealth will soon be gone. The sons of all the nobles have shoved inside my house to court my mother, against her wishes. They should go and ask Icarius, her father, to provide a dowry and to choose who should be her husband. They are too scared. Instead, they haunt our house day after day and kill our cows and pigs and good fat goats. They feast and drink red wine, not caring if they waste it all. There is no man to save the house, no man like him, Odysseus. I cannot fight against them. I would be useless. I have had no training, but if I had the power, I would do it. It is unbearable what they have done. They ruined my whole house. It is not fair. You suitors should all feel ashamed. Consider what others in the neighborhood will think, and also be afraid. The angry gods will turn on you in a rage. They will be shocked at all this criminal behavior. I beg you, by Olympian Zeus, and by the goddess who presides in human meetings, justice. But never mind. Friends, leave me be and let me cry and suffer by myself. Or did Odysseus, my warlike father, deliberately do harm to our own side? Is that why you seem set on hurting me? Encouraging these suitors? Oh, if only you Ithacans would eat my stock yourselves. If you did that, I soon would get revenge. I would come through the town and keep demanding until it all got given back. But now you make me so despondent. This is pointless. He stopped, frustrated, flung the scepter down and burst out crying. Everyone was seized by pity. No one spoke. They hesitated to answer him unkindly. Then at last Antinous began. Telemachus, you stuck-up, willful little boy. How dare you try to embarrass us and put the blame on us? We suitors have not done you wrong. Go blame your precious mother. She is a cunning. It is the third year, soon it will be four, that she has cheated us of what we want. She offers hope to all, sends signs to each, but all the while her mind moved somewhere else. She came up with a special trick. She fixed a mighty loom inside the palace hall. Weaving her fine long cloth, she said to us, Young men, since you are my suitors, since my husband, the brave Odysseus, is dead, I know you want to marry me. You must be patient. I have worked hard to weave this winding sheet to bury good Laertes when he dies. 
He had gained so much wealth, the women would reproach me if he were buried with no shroud. Please let me finish it. And her words made sense to us. So every day she wove the mighty cloth, and then at night, by torchlight, she unwove it. For three long years her trick beguiled the Greeks. But when the fourth year seasons rolled around, a woman slave who knew the truth told us. We caught her there, unraveling the cloth, and made her finish it. This is our answer, so you and all the Greeks may understand. Dismiss your mother. Let her father tell her to marry anyone his heart desires. Athena blessed her with intelligence, great artistry and skill, a finer mind than anyone has ever had before. Even the braided girls of ancient Greece, Tyro, Alcmene, garlanded Mycenae, none of them had Penelope's understanding. But if she wants to go on hurting us, her plans are contrary to destiny. We suitors will keep eating up your wealth and livelihood as long as she pursues this plan the gods have put inside her heart. For her it may be glory, but for you, pure loss. We will not go back to our farms or anywhere until she picks a husband. Telemachus insisted with labored breath. Antonus, I cannot force my mother out of the house. She gave birth to me and raised me. My father is elsewhere, alive or dead. If I insist my mother has to leave, Icarus will make me pay the price, and gods will send more trouble. If she goes, mother will rouse up furies full of hate, to take revenge, and everyone will curse me. I will not. If you feel upset, you go. Out of my house. Stop eating all of my food. Devour each other's property, not mine. Or do you really think it right to waste one person's means of life and go scot-free? Then try it. I will call the deathless gods. May Zeus give recompense some day for this. You will die here, and no one will care. Then Zeus, whose voice resounds throughout the world, sent down two eagles from the mountain peak. At first they hovered on the breath of wind, close by each other, balanced on their wings. Reaching the noisy center of the crowd, they wheeled and whirred and flapped their mighty wings swooping at each man's head with eyes like death, and with their talons ripped each face and neck. Then to the night they flew across the town. Everyone was astonished at the sight. They wondered in their hearts what this could mean.
Telemachus, his mind made up, replied, All right, all of you, I will not ask about this any more. The gods, and all of you, already know. Just let me have a ship and twenty men to make a journey with me, out and back to Sparta and to Sandy Pylos, seeking news about when my father may come home. I may hear it from someone, or from a voice from Zeus, if it happens so. If I find out my father is alive and coming home, I will endure this pain for one more year. But if I hear that he is dead, I will come home to my own land and build a tomb and hold the funeral rites as he deserves, and I will give my mother to a new husband. He then sat down. The crowd broke up. The Athenians went home. The suitors to Odysseus's palace. Telemachus slipped out, and at the beach he dipped his hands in salty gray sea water and asked Athena, Goddess, hear my prayer. Just yesterday you came and ordered me to sail the hazy sea and find out news of my long-absent father's journey home. The Greeks are wasting everything, especially those bullying, mean suitors. Then Athena came near him with the voice and guise of mentor, and spoke to him with words that flew like birds. Telemachus, you will be brave and thoughtful, if your own father's forcefulness runs through you. How capable he was, in word and deed. Your journey will succeed if you are his. If you are not his son by Penelope, I doubt you can achieve what you desire. And it is rare for sons to be like fathers. Only a few are better. Most are worse. But you will be no coward and no fool. You do possess your father's cunning mind, so there is hope you will do all these things. Forget about those foolish suitors' plans. They have no brains and no morality. They do not know Black Doom will kill them all, and some day soon, their death is near at hand. You will achieve the journey that you seek, since I will go with you just like a father. I will equip a good swift ship for you. Now go back home to where the suitors are and get provisions. Pack them in containers, some wine in jars and grain, the strength of men in sturdy skins. And I will go through town calling for volunteers to come with us.
This island, Ithaca, has many ships, both new and old. I will select the best one. We will equip her quickly and sail fast, far off across the sea. That very night, Athena, in the guise of Telemachus, went through the town, recruiting sailors for his journey. Then, once more disguised as mentor, in face and voice, she summoned Telemachus. Telemachus, your crew of armored men is at the ready and at the oar for your departure. Come on, no time to waste. We must be gone. And so she led them, and they followed him. They loaded everything upon the decks, Odysseus's son instructed them and then embarked. Athena led the way. She sat down in the stern, and next to her Telemachus was seated. Then the crew released the ropes and boarded, each at oar. Athena called a favorable wind, pure zephyr whistling on wine-dark sea. Wind blew the middle sail, the purple wave was splashing loudly round the moving keel. The quick black ship held steady, so they fastened the tackle down and filled their cups with wine. They poured libations to the deathless gods, especially to the bright-eyed child of Zeus. All through the night till dawn, the ship sailed on. Book Three Leaving the ocean streams, the sun leapt up into the sky of bronze to shine his light for gods and mortals on fertile earth. Telemachus arrived in Pylos, where the Pylians were bringing to the beach black bulls for sacrifice to Blue Poseidon, Lord of Earthquakes. The Athacans arrived, took down their sails, dropped anchor, and alighted. The goddess with the flashing eyes, Athena, first led Telemachus on shore, then spoke. Do not be shy, Telemachus. You sailed over the sea to ask of your father, whether earth hides him, what his fate might be. So hurry now to Nestor, Lord of Horses. Learn what advice he has in mind for you. Supplicate him yourself, and he will tell you the truth. He is not one to tell a lie. Telemachus replied, But, Mentor, how can I approach and talk to him? I am quite inexperienced at making speeches, and as a young man, I feel awkward talking to elders. She looked straight into his eyes and answered, You will work out what to do, through your own wits and with divine assistance. The gods have blessed you in your life so far.
So Pallas spoke and quickly led them on. He followed in the footsteps of the goddess. They reached the center of the town, where Nestor was sitting with his sons and his companions, putting the meat on spits and roasting it for dinner. When they saw the strangers coming, they all stood up with open arms to greet them, inviting them to join them. Nestor's son, Pisistratus, shook hands and sat them down, spreading soft fleeces on the sand beside his father and his brother, Thrasymedes. He served them giblets and poured some wine into a golden cup and raised a toast to Pallas, child of Zeus, the Aegis Lord. Now, guest, give prayers of thanks to Lord Poseidon and pour libations for the god. This feast is in his honor. Pay him proper dues. Then give the boy the cup of honeyed wine, so he can offer to the deathless gods libations. Everybody needs the gods. I give the golden chalice to you first, because the boy is younger, more my age. He put the cup of sweet wine in her hand. Athena was impressed with his good manners, because he rightly gave it first to her. At once she made a heartfelt prayer. Poseidon, O shaker of the earth, do not refuse to grant our prayer. May all these things come true. Bring fame to Nestor and his sons, and grant gifts to the Pylians, as recompense for this fine sacrifice. And may the quest for which we sailed here in our swift black ship succeed, and may we come home safe again. She made her prayer come true all by herself. She gave Telemachus the splendid cup with double handle, and his prayer matched hers. And then they cooked the outer parts of meat and helped themselves to pieces, sharing round the glorious feast till they could eat no more. <laughs> 